So our next speaker is uh, Luis Hueso, who is currently an Iker Basque research professor and leader of the Nano Devices Group and leader of the and scientific director of the Maria de Maec to Unit of Excellence at uh, Nano Une Research Center in the Basque Country. He obtained a PhD degree in physics at the University of Santiago Compostela, 2002, and has been a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Cambridge and the Italian National Research Council, as well as a lecturer at the University of Leeds before he arrived to the Nano Une Center in 2009. So his research focuses on electronic transports in nanoscale devices and particularly on spintronics and organic electronic applications. Today, he is going to talk us about uh, molecular spintronics. So Luis, uh, thank you very much. We are looking forward to hearing your, your lecture. When you are ready, you can start. Well, thanks, thanks a lot for the, for the introduction. I hope you can hear me well. Yeah. Let me just share the screen. Uh, yeah, this is the right. All right. So, uh, well, again, uh, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks a lot to the invitation. Uh, it was it was really a pleasure to to take part of this school, and I, I think Fernando did a great job organizing it. It's not easy to to put together so many people and such a comprehensive program, but but I think he did a a great work, and and it shows the the activity in the Spanish community as well. So how how we are are working in in, in many of the topics that uh, have been gone through in this in the school it's also great to have uh, uh, people like thomas jungwirth or, or stefan roche uh, you know warming up the audience uh, so you know it's, it's kind of you know strange to to play uh, after them but you know I'll, I'll do my i'll do my best and uh, as as it was uh, mentioned in the introduction i've been working on on organic materials for quite some time um, particularly on, on organic spintronics. So uh, in, during this talk, I'm gonna try to show you some important things about organic spintronics and kind of the motivation and, and some different aspects uh, about organic spintronics. So uh, what I'm not gonna talk about, and uh, please allow me to, to mention that beforehand, I'm not gonna talk about uh, effects like single molecule electronics that are very nice and very popular in, in some communities. I'm just gonna focus on what happens when we have uh, an organic thin film. Something that is very similar to what many people maybe use like uh, organic LEDs for, for displays or organic photovoltaics, this kind of massive somehow devices and how we can use those properties of the molecules present in, in those devices. Uh, in favor of, of spintronics. So uh, the the outline of, of this seminar uh, I prepare is kind of first I, I will I will have kind of a motivation about the topic. And then I will mention three different sections. The first one is what happens with spin transfer in, in organic devices. Then what happens when to those devices we add light, which is a, a degree of freedom which is quite quite interesting and popular. And last, what happens with uh, what we call spin interface, which is uh, spin properties at the interface and how mole molecules can modulate that the spin properties at the interface. All right, so let me let me start on, you know, I'm probably this being a course of, of uh, spin tronics, you have seen this image many, many times, but I, I like it because, you know, it's, even if I'm old and this is way behind my my past way way before i was born so so it shows kind of a remote past in which people had to move these kind of things this is a hard drive for an ibm one of the first hard drives of 20 megabytes of information being moved on a plane with you know with this kind of uh, crate so it's pretty amazing how we move from this to this which is actually the, one of the hard drives I had at home uh, on, on a NAS. So 
I think it's important that we have this always in mind and always present because the technological ad advance from your image on the left hand side to the image on the right hand side has been truly amazing. And it has been possible due to science because we understand things better and there are physical phenomena that we didn't understand and now we do uh, through material science because uh, well, as many people put it, you know, there were things that we could not grow and then we could not understand because the, the experiments were utterly impossible. And then uh, on technology, right? How, how we can do technological solutions to, to get the, the chain moving. And, you know, for instance, in, the, in this image, uh, in, in the Spintronics, we all focus on the magnetic bits uh, here in this hard drive, but for instance, how the head, how the magnetic sensor flies on, on a disc that is rotating at 7,000 RPM and doesn't break that disc and is close enough to feel the magnetic information is something quite truly amazing that doesn't have anything to do with, with the spin, but you know, it's a technological solution that goes together in, in the package. So I think that, that is important that we have this in mind, how we have moved, and the constant need of new materials and new physics to move forward in down the chain. And of course, most of the technological advance uh, was motivated by, by this simple effect, you know, the magnetic tunnel effect, and where we have two magnetic electrodes and we have a tunnel barrier. If in general, if the magnetization of both electrons is parallel to each other, then we have current flowing. Uh, in the device, and when the magnetization of the electrodes is anti-parallel, we don't have current flowing in the device. And that, that's a very common effect that, you know, lead to this very nice uh, tunnel in magnetic resistance. And this is a typical example of 80% on a very reproducible devices that are grown on, on big wafers by, by now routine position methods. And this is so nice and, and very well known. And I'm gonna talk about all these kind of uh, devices with two magnetic electrodes all along my, my presentation. But of course, uh, it works in this material, okay? So you have seen in the, in the previous talk in particular, there are many examples in which, you know, you can put different things with two magnetic electrodes. You can put graphene, you can put, uh, you know, to the magnetic materials. Now they are very popular. You can put many, many different materials, but the fact is that all the technology is based on this epitaxial magnesium oxide junction. That's it. I mean, this is a TN image and you can, you can observe the different atoms of the iron and the magnesium oxide. This is the super nice quality uh, junctions uh, grown by, by sputtering and post annealing. And, you know, we had a very nice evolution that moved from, from amorphous tunnel barriers that looked like uh, it was you know, difficult to get a breakthrough to the MGO crystalline barriers already 15 years ago, and how those barriers have much larger magnetic resistance values of a few hundred percent, and much more control uh, in terms of growth and, and their properties. And this is all great, but again, we are always looking for, for new solutions and new physics to understand what's happening at, and, and, you know, with the spins. And that's the motivation of organic spintronics. And there are, there are a few uh, aspects that I would like to mention. What is interesting about organic materials for spintronics? So in the first place, I would like to mention as, as in a very similar argument to what uh, Stefan did in the, in the previous talk about graphene, the weak spin relaxation mechanism. So in general, you know, we have here carbon atoms, which is a weak element. We also have hydrogen as well, or oxygen, but in general, they're weak elements. So they are, they are not strong sources of spin relaxation, like heavy metals, for instance. So that, that's something interesting, because sometimes we are looking for a material that has a, a long spin relaxation time. In the, in the second place, I would like to mention what I call light response or even multifunctionality, because there is a wealth of work 
on organic electronics. You can do organic transistors, you can do organic light emitting devices. All that knowledge can be applied now you know, to the organic spintronics. We must never forget what we have done before, but try to adapt it to our circumstances. In the third place, I would like to mention the, the chemical tunability. And I think that's a very important factor, particularly for, for us uh, physicists that, that work in, in spintronics. And the main key factor here is that chemists are able to change many things in molecules. And sometimes they're even able to change properties on demand. You may need stronger link to the surface or a, a weaker uh, metal organic uh, structure. And those things can be tuned and can be designed at your wish. And, and the, the possibilities are endless. And, and there's certainly much motivation than in inorganic materials in which sometimes we are tightly bounded, but we can and we cannot do. And in the fourth place, I would like to mention the interfacial effects. And this is what I will talk in the, in the last part of the, of, the, of the seminar. But I think it's important that we understand that interfaces and molecules are a very fruitful playground. Uh, the, the things that you can do with molecules on a surface, you can really not do with uh, inorganic materials. The kind of bonding, the kind of uh, dipoles at the interface, that, that's a, a, you know, a variability that is amazing and that we can use in favor of organic spintronics. So let me just give you a few examples of these different uh, motivations for, for organic spintronics. And you know, in the first place, I was saying that the, the mechanisms of uh, spin relaxation are very weak. General spin orbit is very weak because the elements are relatively uh, light. We have hyperfine interaction, mostly coming from, from nuclear hydrogen, and that turns out to be sometimes the main source of spin relaxation. So hyperfine is sometimes larger than, than spin orbit in certain molecules because of that nuclear. And this has been tested by, by many ways, for instance, by EPR measurements. It's a very common method to test a spin-spin interaction and spin lattice interactions, and you can extract or, uh, T1 and T2 uh, of, of different materials. And well, I don't want to get into that, but you know, the, the numbers that you can see here are relatively large. You can do also Rabi oscillations in which you, you prepare a spin on a molecule and you make it oscillate and then you leave it and you see how much time that the spin takes to, to uh, relax completely. And in general, we have times that in the most uh, optimistic case, they reach milliseconds, which is our amazing times, extremely long. And in the worst case scenario, there will be many nanoseconds, which is nice and comparable to the, to the cases that we had in, in graphene as well, where we have some theoretical predictions that mention extremely large numbers. But you know, then in, in reality, there you have many more sources of, of spin decoherence and, and the, those numbers go down a lot. But uh, in any case, times in the order of 100 nanoseconds are beyond what inorganic materials can provide us. And that's a very important motivation if we want to play with the spins for a long time and do things with them. Then, of course, I mentioned the, the light responsivity. And many of you will have an organic light emitting diode in your mobile phone, that the, the screens, you know, AMOLED or uh, different incarnations, depending on the manufacturer, Samsung, LG, uh, are based on polymers, you know, molecular ledgers that you spin code and they emit light. And that's pretty amazing how it's done. You can also do the, the uh, opposite effect in which you have organic photovoltaic rather than emitting light, then you collect light and you generate current. So it's you know more or less the same effect, but, but inverse. And it's important to realize that these are you know commercial devices. So there is there is a great knowledge in terms of the uh, the chemistry, in terms of the physical processes, in terms of the materials that we could eventually profit for for organic spintronics, and we should not forget that. And of course, I also wanted to mention, as I mentioned said before, the, the chemical and morphological flexibility, how we can change the chemical composition and even the shape of the molecules to adapt to what we want. 
And something that is uh, quite amazing to me is the possibility to tune metal work functions. So uh, when you have a, a, a metallic material, that metal has a work function, the, the distance you know, between the Fermi level and the, and the vacuum. So it's like the you know, photovoltaic effect, the energy that you need to take one electron out. And uh, when you study physics, that seems to be like a number, right? And gold is that number. And that seems to be written on stone and never, never gonna change. But the fact actually is that you can change it and you can change it by a lot. And with molecules, you can create interfacial dipoles. And we see here in this, in this cartoon that is from one of the first references uh, I, I put here, this uh, nice uh, review, which is still quite, quite important in spite of being more than 10 years old by, by Bill Salanek and, and Matt Falman. And you can create these interfacial dipoles that go up or down the work function by even more than one electron volt, which is absolutely massive energy. And you can do extremely easily putting certain molecules in contact with your metal. And this is something that uh, as we have seen probably uh, in different talks, and we see many more talks later on, interfaces are critical for spin tronics, tunnel junctions, you know, uh, contacts to, with magnetic materials, etc. So this capability is also something that, that, you know, is kind of a dream of things that we can do. So I said that, I think it was a kind of, a, you know, broad picture of what can be a, a good or some motivation to study organic uh, spintronics. And again, uh, here I'm not going to talk about uh, molecules, okay? So many people can do experiments with one single molecule. And certainly many people can do experiments with uh, scanning tunnel in microscope and molecules on surfaces, how the molecules couple to, uh, to substrates, what kind of uh, excitations you can do on those molecules, you can put a magnetic substrate, you can put a magnetic tip. There are lots of extremely nice examples from many groups, but I, I will here mostly talk about devices, devices that resemble tunnel junctions or, or GMR layers, and that you can build in a lab with you know, relatively big sizes. So let's, let's go to the, to the first part, which is the basic device, which is the spin transport devices. So the actual first, you know, hint of that you can transport spins in an organic layer came from my, my former boss, from Alec Dedu in, in Bologna in, in 2004. He did a, a lateral device in which you had uh, two manganide electrodes and a layer of uh, sexy theophene, which is a very simple molecule in between. And he saw some hints of magneto resistance that, you know, were kind of strange, but it, it pointed out that the spins were traveling from one electrode to the other. But to be honest, the, the main big shot was uh, when uh, the group of, of Vali Vardeni in, in, in Utah pro, uh, published this uh, article in 2004, in which they basically sandwich a layer of this molecule. This is aluminum quinoline. It's a metal organic uh, molecule based on aluminum, and it's very, very popular for, uh, for light emission, or particularly was very popular. Now there are more performing uh, materials. And they sandwich it between a magnetic electrode at the bottom, which is a manganite, the antonin strontium manganese oxide, and a cobalt layer on top. And they, uh, you can measure the transfer from the top to the bottom. You can put you know, two electrodes from top to bottom, and they show this. They show some IV curves at different temperatures and some magneto resistance. And this was kind of a large excitement, but the problem is that quite rightly, some people, including our group, pointed out that, well, maybe there was something wrong here. Because uh, you see these IV curves, don't change with temperature much, okay? You have different temperatures from room temperature to quite low temperature, and they don't change much, right? They're almost the same. And this is quite disconcerting because 
this kind of cars that don't change with temperature, what they are telling you is that you have tunneling, you know, quantum mechanical tunneling that changes very little with temperature. Because if you are measuring a layer of an organic material, this is what are typically called organic semiconductors, okay? So you have hopping from molecule to molecule and hence a very much temperature activated transport. So you should see a big change in temperature, which was not the case. And you, indeed you have magnetic resistance, but of course you have magnetic materials, right? So you may have probably tunneling. So there was on one hand, a lot of excitement, but on the other hand, a lot of controversy. And pe many people were wondering if like, do actually spins travel through the device? How can that be? How, how are the physical proofs that that's happening? And if so, what are we measuring? So I'm gonna show you an example of what we do in our lab, step by step to show how a spin transport device, an organic spin transport device has to be fabricated and measured and the conclusions that you can extract from them. So uh, I'm gonna show you one specific case. I have worked with many um, different molecules, but this is a quite simple case. It's, this is called BCP, bathocuproin. It's a very small molecule. You can see here only composed by carbon, nitrogen and hydrogen. And uh, it's a very popular molecule in, in all these kind of organic electronic devices. That's why we chose it. In fact, we chose it because we can grow it by sublimation in ultra high vacuum. So we don't, we don't deal with chemicals. We don't deal with you know, things that may complete our device for, for something nice and clean to start with. We wanted to grow something in ultra high vacuum. And uh, it's robust and it's commercial. That's important because you want something that you can buy grams of it with very, very high purity coming from the manufacturer. And uh, eventually it could be integrated with other devices like OLEDs or OPPVs because you know it's, it's already there. There are lots of reports of how this molecule behaves in organic electronic devices, optoelectronic devices. So uh, what we do, okay, so let me, so you, we do more or less the same as Bali Vardeni did. We get a silicon oxide elect, uh, substrate. We deposit some lines of uh, cobalt in our case. We then we deposit the organic material in some of them. And then we put a top electrode. And in our case, typically is nickel iron, right? Another magnetic electrode. And then we can measure from top to bottom in four geometries. Here yeah, we put current from top to bottom and we measure the voltage from top to bottom and we see what happens. So as I mentioned, we have typically cobalt and permaloid, could be other alternatives, doesn't really matter for this case. And we use typically a, a, a very nice, uh, very, very thin aluminum oxide layer that we call leaky barrier that protects the bottom electrode and helps to grow the molecular layer by, by sublimation. And you know, there are lots of references that we published over the years with different compounds, seeing different physical effects. I mean, it's a bit too long for, for going through everything, but I just wanted to show you a bit the, the sketch. And uh, oh, let me see if this go. No, sorry, uh, one back. Uh, all right. So here is, is how it grows, it's a video of, of how it grows. So first we have the silicon, silicon oxide substrate that you can see here. We clean it really well to make sure that it's very flat. We put an in situ mask and we grow a cobalt layer. This cobalt layer has this shape so we can you know, contact it. Then we put the aluminum in another chamber, a very nice uh, aluminum layer. I hope you can see this. Then we oxidize it very, rapidly to protect the cobalt. Cobalt oxidizes even in vacuum. So we have to be very careful. We put another mask, we grow the molecular layer. Okay, so these are the molecules and thickness of around a few nanometers. And then we grow the top layer. And what you can see here that this is an actual rendering of the actual device, right? So you can see here the different contacts that we can make to the different materials, the cobalt here at the bottom and the permaloid. So what do we do first? Well, uh, 
So we do x-rays. And I think this is important because it shows us how is the quality of the devices in the long run, okay? So for instance, you, you can do a grazing angle x-ray of the cobalt and you see many of these oscillations and each oscillation it's happening because you know at a different angle the incident beam is hitting at the bottom of the cobalt and hitting at the top of the cobalt and is creating this interference pattern and the more interfering fringes you have the better is the quality so basically the more parallel at uh, the bottom and the top of your uh, electrode of your material if it's very grainy and, and you know rough then you lose the interference very quickly and of course you have a very nice interference patterns at the bottom a quite nice interference pattern for the molecular layer as well and even a good interference pattern of the permaloid on top of the molecule so even on the whole stack you can get a good quality and very small roughness and this is nice because we are working here with devices which are maybe like 10 by 10 microns of size. Okay, so they are really macroscopic devices. There is nothing nanoscopic here, but the molecule, right? So the devices are really big and it's important that their overall quality in such large area is as good as possible. So we can do also control studies of how is the roughness at the small distances. And you can see here that the cobalt is super smooth, is as smooth as, as the silicon oxide almost. And how, of course, the molecules and the permaloy on the molecules increases the roughness, but always below a nanometer, okay? That's the uh, mean roughness we have in, in our layer in areas of microns. So, you know, if you think that maybe a molecule is half a nanometer, basically you have that kind of oscillation in the short range. So that's also a very nice idea that the quality of the devices is good. And last, you can, if you, uh, you know, have the ability and the possibilities, you can do TM, so you can cross section the, the device. And you can see here in, in this test device that we did with a very thick layer of aluminum and you see the cobalt, you, you see the aluminum clearly distinguished, you see the BCP and this uh, is five nanometers of, of thickness, okay, of, of distance. So there's a very, very thin layer that is very, very nice and homogeneous and the nickel iron doesn't interpenetrate. So there are a number of, of tricks here that you can uh, do for for reducing the interpenetration, typically, you know, off access uh, deposition, hidden deposition, cooling the substrate to decrease the, the energy of the impacting particles. There are a number of, of, of uh, uh, tricks. If anyone has uh, the need of more information, I will be happy to provide. But, you know, overall, the quality is extremely good. And that's important for studying the devices without the spurious effects. So, what do we measure? All right, so we measure, for instance, at different temperatures, the current versus the voltage, the typical IV curve, what happens from the top to the bottom. And as you can see here, there is a big temperature dependent, okay? The temperature, if you plot here, the resistance area product of our junction versus the temperature, you can see how it goes up in logarithmic scale until it reaches a plateau. And these blue points, which correspond to our junctions, it's basically what you would expect from a device in which you're measuring an organic material. Okay, again, organic materials, uh, the transport is basically by hopping from one molecule to another molecule. So the, the electron has a very tedious and complicated steps to make from molecule to molecule. When you freeze the molecules at low temperatures, that hopping, which is basically de exponentially dependent on the, on the temperature, makes it very, very difficult and then you have a much higher resistance, okay? So when you have junctions, which are wrong, I would say, uh, and, and I can give you more details again, if you wish in the questions, then you have a resistance that is almost independent of temperature. So you don't see, that activated behavior and that tells you that this is most likely quantum tunneling rather than hopping from molecule to molecule. So once you have uh, 
some kind of idea that the transport is going through the molecules, then you can measure in a magnetic field. And what you observe is that uh, you have a magnetoresistance versus the magnetic field different thickness. And I show you just here a simple thickness. For five nanometers, you have a very nice curve. You have this kind of mega ohms in our resistance. So this means that the molecules in a five nanometer film are acting as transport layer for the spins, right? Because if you don't have a spin transport, you would don't have magnetoresistance. Magnetoresistance comes strictly associated with the spin transport. But even in, in thick layers, I call thick like 60 nanometer layers that have a huge resistance of giga ohms, you still see magnetoresistance. So that means that spins are traveling through these thick layers and keep moving the magnetic information from the top to the bottom of this device, okay? So this is a very simple experiment that indicates uh, basically that a spin transport is possible through these molecules. So what can we learn from this? Well, you will say not much. We have just a few percent of magnetic resistance. So what's the big deal, right? Because I show like a few hundred percent before. But the nice thing here is that we are dealing with materials in which, as I mentioned, transport is extremely complicated. So the mobilities that we have are extremely low. Stefan talked about the mobilities in graphene of, you know, they can reach 100,000 centimeters volts per second, centimeters square volt per second. Here in the BCP case, the mobility that we can extract from the current voltage curves of the order on 10 to the minus six. And there is a very quick calculation that you can do because basically the, your uh, spin relaxation time depends on the magnetoresistance of you know, the, the value that you have, but depends also on the speed of your electrons, right? The quicker they go, the less time they need, right? Since in this case, the transport is extremely slow, charge transport is extremely slow, but the magnetoresistance is still very sizable. It tells you that the spin relaxation times in these materials is very, very long. And here we are approaching microseconds. That's an important conclusion that I think you should take home. That perhaps, these are not the most performing devices in terms of the actual value of the magnetoresistance that you can get. But they may be some of the most performing ones in terms of the spin relaxation time that their carriers have for reaching one electrode to the other. So they may not get that far, they only get But that's because they move very, very slowly and it takes an awful amount of time to get from one electrode to the other. And still, still the spin is preserved. So let me just uh, wrap up this first part. So basically I showed you that there is spin tunneling, but also most importantly, spin transport in organic film. And you may be surprised, but this is something that many people didn't believe because you know, from the physical point of view, the physics of these devices is very different from the physics of, of inorganic semiconductors in which a spin transport was sought after for many years. We have a, a relatively large magnetoresistant response considering the thicknesses that we are playing with. We have to be very careful because the fabrication is not trivial. You merge different materials with different needs and that gives you lots of spurious effects. But in general, we have, in the worst case scenario, spin relaxation times of the orders of tens of nanoseconds. And in the best case scenario, we have spin relaxation times of the order of even microseconds. All right, so let me just go uh, briefly to the second part. I think I'm taking a bit too much time and I'm, I'm you know, going a bit slow, but I think you know, there's, there's no rush, right? Uh, so I will cut this second part a bit short and then I will focus on the, on the third one. So 
uh, spin optical devices are important because uh, you know on the one hand we had all that knowledge about the organic ele optoelectronic devices that we need to use but also because also because there are many predictions on how spins can affect the the uh, efficiency of organic devices and this is an image of, a, of an article we published more than a decade ago and how a, a organic light emitting device with magnetic electrodes that inject spin polarized carriers should have more efficiency than a normal uh, non spin polarized led and this is this is something that actually quite recently the group of uh, eugenio coronado and the group of alec that demonstrated so it's, it's something that took a decade to do but but uh, it's out there so how sp knowledge are, are performing but also there is something extra that may not look amazing but for me it was very important is that if we have optical response in our devices it means that we are measuring the molecules so again uh, you know many people claim that the molecules didn't play any role in these devices and it was all a spurious effect but if optics happens the optical response cannot come from the cobalt cannot come from the nickel iron it has to come from these organic devices that you are putting there so it's an extra layer of of uh, you know checking your results and just stay with me for a minute and maybe now you can see me because i realized i was in the dark but anyway you know i think it, it now it's much much better for for you know for the presentation so having said that, uh, I wanted to show you how very, very briefly I'm going to do it, how in a uh, device very similar to the one I showed you in the first part, in which we have cobalt and nickel iron, but with a layer, in this case, of fullerenes, we can create a spin photovoltaic device. So we have the same kind of geometry, but here we can irradiate light through the structure. And what happens is that we have magneto current. We have the, the typical, we call it here magneto current because we measure current, but this is a magneto resistance. You can rename it. And you can see here the typical butterfly that is showing us that we have a spin transport through our structure. But we also have photovoltaic effect. Okay. So the curve, the IV curve, this is the current in the device and the voltage on the device in dark conditions is this one, the blue one, and it goes through zero, zero. But when we put light, appears an open circuit voltage and a, a short circuit current. So the curve is, is displaced towards the right. And here we can see how this device is also a photovoltaic cell. At the same time, we have a photovoltaic cell and a spin cell, both together that play simultaneously. And they play simultaneously. I'm going to skip some slides. Sorry for this uh, kind of quick uh, jump. But I'm going to show you again the IV curves. And this is the curve in the dark. But when we have on light, we have two different ones. One with the electrodes parallel. The bottom and the top electrodes would be parallel in this case or how we can rotate one of them and go into the anti-parallel orientation. And the curves are different. So we not only have a magnetoresistance effect, we not only have a photovoltaic effect, we have a photovoltaic effect that depends on the magnetoresistance that is mediated by the magnetic field. And this is quite cool because we can play a lot with the light and we can create, for instance, I'm just going to show you a couple of examples. Uh, we can do a current inverter. That current flows from the top to the bottom or from the bottom to the top, changing the parameters of our device. We can create a, a device that has a, any pretty much any value of magneto current, extremely going into the infinite because we are able to, to zero the background playing with the light and with the voltage. And we can create even fully spin polarized currents, a current that flows in our device that it has only one spin orientation. So this is, this is a complex device. 
I don't, I don't want to get too much into it uh, right now. But I think here, what I would like to, to conclude in this part is that light is a further test for speed transport. But if we integrate them both, we can get effects that otherwise would be impossible. And here, it's not simply a game because we have spins and light. It's because the light and the spin are intermerging. We have a, a, an IV curve of the photovoltaic effect that changes with the orientation of our electrons, with the spin polarization of the carriers that we are injecting in our device. And that creates a new physics that is very, very interesting. Of course, we have performance improvement. So the efficiency of our photovoltaic cell can be improved with the magnetic field. And you know there are many other materials <coughs> and architectures. So what I showed you uh, in this particular example was based on C60, which is an N-type semiconductor. So we have a N-type photovoltaic cell, but we recently created a P-type photovoltaic cell. And now we would like to integrate them and do a NP junction in which we can have a much, much bigger response, but still keeping a spin transport through the structure. So I think there are, there are many things uh, in terms of organic optical devices with, with the spintronics that can be done. And, and it's certainly uh, something that would be great to, to take all the knowledge that was there in the past. So uh, I think I have something like uh, maybe 15 minutes, something like that. Uh, I hope I have 15 minutes. Yes, yes, you have 15, okay. even 20 minutes more. All right, so I, I don't want to take too much, uh, too much of a time, you know, because people eventually get tired, I know. But, uh, but let me go through the last part, which is the in spin interface part. So what happens at the interface with the molecules and how we can profit from it. So I showed you this, this image uh, before. So how, you know, it's basically a, a very, very broad cartoon, how you put molecules and you can increase or decrease the interfacial dipole of the interface between a metal and a molecular layer. And, you know, this was originally a very much thought for organic electronics because people thought like, well, okay, I need to uh, uh, inject carriers into a material but I have a very large energy barrier. My Fermi levels are not aligned. How can I do it? People started to realize that putting molecules, you can tune those Fermi levels, uh, reduce the, the, the potentials, and get a much better uh, carrier injection. So it was very, very popular for LEDs to make OLEDs work at lower voltages. These are the kind of tricks that you use. Because of course, you don't want an LED that you need 25 volts to, to shine. You want it with one volt, half a volt, with a voltage that a, a, a mobile phone can operate with. So there is a lot of work on molecular tuning of interfacial dipoles. And this is kind of an image of, of what happens when you go uh, with a molecule onto a surface. So you can have, for instance, here a molecule, what we will call quasi-free, okay? So you have it completely detached in, in, in vacuum, okay? So it will be, for instance, this molecule, which is totally unconnected to the substrate. And basically what you have are very, two very narrow levels, the, the OMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital, and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital on the top, right? So you have these two levels, which is the equivalent, so to be for physicists to the balance and the conduction band, right? So this is, the Fermi energy, so here you have carriers that they need to move to the LUMO for transport. And that's, that's quite simple. But then you can put another, uh, get closer to the, to the material that now you don't have the, the molecule free here in the back and you have it a bit connected to the substrate. But in any case, the, the width of your uh, band of the metal divided by the energy of the interaction is much, much larger than one. So the interaction, so to say, it's weak. And in this case, what you have is a broadening of your orbitals, okay? You have an, a broadening caused basically because you have a, a larger timing of the residence, 
and a bigger interaction, and then you have a slight broadening of these orbitals. But when you go to a molecule which is much strongly connected, and it has, for instance, a covalent bonding with your substrate, in this case, what happens is that the, the interaction energy is much larger than the bandwidth of the metal. We are in this condition. And what occurs is that you don't have any more the, the broadening, but you have basically a bonding antibonding uh, scenario, in which you know this is the, the equivalent of the uh, how to say hydrogen uh, atom when you're studying in, in quantum physics, right? You have the interaction and suddenly you have the splitting in bonding and antibonding states because the interaction is fairly strong. So you have a very big change on the properties of your molecule. And it's the same molecule. Let's let, let not be confused. It's not another molecule. It can be the same molecule that is here, quasi-free, a bit attached or very connected to the material, okay? And this, of course, can be tuned with the chemical bonds, etc. But the, the physics that you're gonna have it's completely different and very much uh, changing from one case to the other. And that, of course, that affects the molecule, it affects the metal, it changes the interfacial dipoles, but it could affect also spins and magnetism at the interface. And how we saw that? Well, I'm gonna show you quite uh, old work that, uh, that we did with a group of uh, Senegres Thales many years ago. So here, basically, we studied the same aluminum quinoline uh, that I showed you. So we have a, a electrode of a lanthanum strontium manganese. We have an aluminum quinoline layer, and uh, we have a cobalt electrode. But these junctions are done by nano indentation. So basically, you have this structure without the cobalt. You go with an AFM tip. You press a bit. You make a, a very very small hole of the order of ten by ten nanometers only, and then you deposit cobalt in the junction. And the nice thing is that you can, with the with a feedback loop of the of the uh, AFN conductive tip, you can, for instance, control very well how much molecule you are leaving behind, and hence, for instance, your barrier thickness, which an extreme precision, like, you know, zero that you are actually contacting the cobalt touches the the bottom electrode two nanometers, three nanometers, five nanometers, you can do it with very nice control. And you're picking only a few molecules. So here you don't have, you know, one molecule is in one orientation, the other is in another one. You are just picking a few molecules, so you have very nice study of the interfacial effects. Again, here, we are not studying the transport through the molecules, okay? Here, we are not doing, uh, an organic spin device in which we go through molecule from molecule to molecule. The thickness is in the order of one, two nanometers. So we have quantum tunneling from the bottom electrode here, the LSMO, to the cobalt. But we have tunneling mediated by molecules. So it's not that the molecules are not making any role. They will have a massive role, as you will see. Simply that we don't have transport through them. This is not hopping through the molecules from one electrode to the other, as I showed you when we have like 20 nanometers layer. No, here we have just a few nanometers and hence quantum tunneling is the predominant mechanism. As soon as we go to these junctions, let's say of five nanometers, we don't have tunneling anymore because hopping starts to dominate the, the process. And what do we measure here? Well, we measure the magneto resistance and you see now that we have a huge effect. An effect that goes, well, in a few hundred percent. And this is not what was measured, you know, by Bali Vardeni uh, in, the, in, the, in his nature paper on big junction. Now we have a very big effect. And we kept wondering, where is this effect coming? Why, why are we measuring such a large magneto resistance response that goes beyond what we could imagine with these electrodes? And the reason, and moreover, there is another question, and is that the response is positive rather than what it was measured before, which was this butterfly, but in the opposite direction, a negative magneto resistance. And again, I don't want to get too much into it, but what it turns out is that our junction 
it's not really two magnetic electrodes, like you can see here, LSMO and cobalt, and an organic layer. Our junction is more complicated because the first molecules are hybridized, are hybridized with our electron. And since they are hybridized in our, with our electron, as I saw before, as I showed you before, the, the density of states is gonna change and it's gonna change in such a way that the polarization changes. Now we have effects that change the, the bandwidth but also the relative position of a spin up and a spin down. So for instance, this is again a cartoon. I don't want to get into all the calculations, but you know, there is, when we go to the strong metamolecular coupling, sorry, uh, this structure that could be, for instance, the density of the states of cobalt changes in such a way that now the polarization at the Fermi level is different. So molecules not only change the surface dipole and the Fermi level, they change the spin polarization of the magnetic material. And this is something quite important to grasp because the spin polarization of a material is something like, okay, it's that one. But many years ago, we realized that that's not true. The spin polarization changes, for instance, with the tunneling barrier that you put. And the spin polarization of a cobalt junction with MgO is much higher than a cobalt junction with aluminum oxide. So here is somehow we follow that reasoning line. And the spin polarization of our junction with molecules are different and we can even reverse it. We have a number of, of games to play that are extremely limited within organic materials and that here we have a much more open ground to play with. So I must say that the paper we wrote was kind of impossible to read. So, uh, so luckily uh, our colleague Stefano Sambito did a, 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 you know, a news and views about it, which is plain actually what we wanted to explain. And I think you know, we, we somehow struggled because it was a very complicated concept, but he did a cartoon because he didn't have to do the physics. But I think this cartoon reflects very well what's going on. And you can see here, this is the, for, for instance, cobalt. And you have a positive spin polarization at the Fermi level, more spins up than down. And here is your molecule free that doesn't interact, and that's fine. But when the molecule approaches, basically the, the orbitals of the molecule broaden. And what happens now is that in this new structure, that is now your new magnetic electrode, the spins up are going, for instance, to a spin down state. And hence, the overall spin polarizations of the electrons coming up this way is going to be reversed. OK? So I think this is an important concept. We are playing with broadenings, and we are playing with energy levels which are massive. And that allow us to change properties which look like very inherent to a material, such as the spin polarization, in a device. We can have a different molecule with a different geometry, and hence the broadening is going to be different, and the polarization, for instance, in this case, will be kept positive. So since the chemists can change how the molecules tune to the surfaces, we can play a lot and have different effects here. And this is actually what we did with this molecule. This is a very complicated molecule, which is uh, these quinol groups but it also has a, a sodium dispersion center for stabilization. And you have chlorine atoms rather than the normal oxygens that they give you a different metal hybridization. So what we did is that we built tunnel junctions, not you know, devices as we did with thick layers. We did devices, but with very, very thin layers of the order of a few nanometers to one, two, three, to study transport not transport, but tunneling, and focus on the properties of the interface. So you can see here how the tunneling curves, they don't change, right? You are in tunneling, not in transport regime. So uh, we basically put the cobalt, then we put a nice aluminum layer isolating the cobalt. We put the uh, molecules and then permaloy on top. So, we did that, but in different stacking order. So for instance, we have this sample, we have the permaloy at the bottom, 
the alumina that protects the permalloy, the molecule, and the cobalt. So here, the only molecular hybridization, it comes from the molecule with the cobalt. And when you measure the magnetoresistance, you see a positive one. OK, fair enough. But when we reverse the stacking and we put the cobalt at the bottom protected, and the only molecular hybridization comes from this side with the nickel iron, we have a negative magnetoresistance. So what's happening here? What's happening is that the molecule is hybridizing with the nickel, and in particular with the nickel, and it's changing the spin polarization of this electrode to negative and giving us a negative magnetoresistance. So here we have positive spin polarization at the bottom, positive polarization at the top. Here we have positive polarization at the bottom and negative at the top because of the hybridization. Why we know that? Well, we know it because when we go to the synchrotron and we measure the different edges, we see that at the nitrogen edge and the iron edge, we see a different coming from this extra hybridization. So this broadening of the, of the uh, levels at the metal molecule interface allow us to change it, the magnetoresistance in a device. So this is something that you cannot do with inorganic materials. And that with a clever interface control interaction, you can do with organic spintronics. Can you do more things? Well, you know, probably this is something that has been going on for ages, you know, but it's very, very difficult to see. So there are a few examples I, I put here that all results of spectroscopy that now they are being seen with a different light. So people are able to understand what happens more at the, at the interfaces and at the magnetic properties of the interfaces. And, you know, there is one remarkable example is the, this, this uh, study from the group of my colleague Oscar Cespedes at the University of Leeds, that they are able to create magnetic copper. So copper, by the interaction with fullerenes and by the charge transfer that happens at the interface, it's able to become magnetic. And this is something truly remarkable, in which you alter the ground state of a material in such a way that you create a magnetic material where it's not by the molecular interaction. So the possibilities that have these are, are endless, and I think they are very, very attractive in terms of the devices and the physics that you can learn around it. So I think with this, you know, I showed you that, that these metal molecular interfaces are a very nice playground for a spin. You can do very nice things in terms of spin polarization, magnetization, hardening, then there are lots of effects here that, that can be played, put to a, to a play. For instance, I showed you that the effective spin polarization is tunable by hybridization, and it's something that was not trivial at all at the beginning to see. These effects have been seen at single molecule level. There are multiple experiments with STM that see related things, but also for us, importantly, at thin field level, at the device level. And last that, you know, the metals can change, not only the molecules broaden and change the density, metals can change, for instance, coercivity or massively, they can become magnetic or leave magnetism. So this is pretty amazing. And, you know, I, I, with this, I think that the, the whole message for this is that, you know, spin transport in organics is cool, is nice, and the spin survive quite a long time in organic materials. It's not easy to see, but it's a very nice, you know, effect that we have other degrees of freedom like light, you know, that they are very, very attractive because you can merge spins and light and, and have, you know, complex interactions at the physical level. And last, I believe that interfaces, of course, are a super nice playground. They have been for many years for many devices, but I think for spin physics and organics are particularly fruitful. And I hope to have given you kind of an overview of what's going on and not to have bore you too much. So thank you very much, everyone, for, for your attention. Thanks uh, to you, Luis, for your very, very clear ad hoc, broad overview of uh, molecular spintronics. Uh, 
while we are a way for uh, people to write their own questions in the other platform, I have a couple of uh, questions for you. Uh, you have at the end of the talk uh, clearly show that at least for a couple of um, uh, molecular uh, mo molecules, it is possible to tune the the, the spin the, the polarization of the spin in in uh, in these uh, tunnel junctions. Is it a general result of uh, or, or uh, molecular uh, spintronics or? Yes, actually, it seems that it's almost impossible not to tune it. So. Uh, uh, it's it's something that we believe it was like wow this is amazing mm. but but actually uh, if we, we want to put it a bit downgrade in it it's it's kind of boring because almost every molecule interacts enough with a with a magnetic material in such a way that the polarization is changed you may not reverse it completely but that you change it is as i said it's almost impossible not to change it so uh the playground is massive. I mean, you, you have cobalt that has a polarization uh, from the density of states of around 30%. Uh, and you can go higher, you can go lower. Uh, you can, you always are going to do things. What I think is, is complicated uh, is to have an understanding uh, beforehand. So I think the theory, uh, since it invokes very delicate interactions between the molecules, how the molecule positions on the surface, how it connects with the atoms, etc. The calculations are, are very complicated and expensive, or at least that was my colleagues tell me. So it's not always trivial to do a calculation before you actually do the experiment. So sometimes it's actually easier to do the experiment and see what happens and then try to understand it. But it would be great in the same way as, as Stefan mentioned, like with the magic angle graphene and all the possible possibilities to have like a brute force calculation. Here, it would also be interesting to, to have a, a lot of knowledge beforehand and to expect uh, certain results, of course. And what about the effect of uh, temperature? At the very beginning, you have told us that uh, coping is very dependent on temperature. Uh, mm -hmm. for these uh, systems. Now, since we are not talking about hoping, but tunneling, is it uh, the temperature yeah. relevant? No, not really. I mean, because the, all these changes, again, uh, all these changes in the at the interface, the energy scales are massive. I mean, you change things by half electron volt, one electron volt, which is way, way above any thermal broadening, any thermal energy. And that's what it makes them so reliable because they are so big, that it doesn't, I mean, okay, you could go to any temperature that the effect, the energy of the effect is gonna be much bigger. And that's why they are so popular for organic electronics. I mean, it's the same effect uh, behind the, the LEDs on the, on the mobile phones. That's why they turn on at very low voltages because people were able to tune the energy levels so precisely to have light at very low voltages. And we are simply profiting from all that knowledge that is around in the community. Okay, thank you. Um, some questions from the audience. David, uh, many thanks for your talk. My question is, if organic materials show long spin realization times, could they still be interesting for high speed applications? Could they be useful in, for instance, uh, next generation communication circuits? Uh, no, <laughs> I think yeah, that's the, the short answer. The, the long answer is, is uh, not for the kind of circuits that you may be thinking, like, you know, normal electronics with organics is very, very slow. And, and you have this charge transport that is slow. So basically, if you get something to work in one megahertz, you are lucky. So not really. But of course, there are many applications. If you're thinking, for instance, quantum computation, and you know, in Zaragoza, there are very good examples of people working on, on, on molecules for quantum computation. The speed is not really the key factor, uh, but the interactions that you can build between the, the molecular speeds is the key factor. And the, the speed as such, we think on a, on a normal processor that needs to be gigahertz to be competitive, it somehow loses their meaning in these new computing scenarios. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Jorge Lobocheca, thank you, Luis, for this inspiring talk. I wanted to ask you about how critical is the vacuum in the systems you grow up, uh, you grow, and in particular in the devices. The inter interfacial properties can change a lot with contamination. Do you need 10, 10, uh, 10 to the minus 10 uh, millibar? Thank you. Uh, no, the answer again is no, the short is no. Uh, I, I think, uh, well, he would like to have 10 to the minus 10 as I do because we are physicists, right? So we like everything to be super clean and that, but the, the reality is that many people grow these kind of devices in, in evaporators with a door and they work. So uh, you just have to be a bit careful how you do the recipes, but it's not terribly critical. Probably because the devices you average and, and in the kind of studies where you do like surface science or STM, every defect counts. For us, every defect kind of averages and then we, we just integrate it into the electrical response. So and it's not massively important. And the interactions of the molecules, again, seem to be quite robust compared to, you know, a bit of defects that may be available on the surface. Thank you. Um, Jose Solano wants to know, how far does the change of polarization extends into the ferromagnet? Is this long? If so, how do you intuitively explain how an interface effect can be so important? All right, that, that's a very interesting question. So uh, in the ferromagnet, we believe it extends a few atomic distances only. Here we are talking really interface. So there is a very, very nice example uh, from the group of, of uh, Bissan Rapin in, in Paris. So, so they, they grew uh, cobalt and they grew, um, in, this is in ultra high vacuum, okay? This, so this is surface science, they really need to do it in surface science. And then they grew fullerenes and they saw that growing uh, sub monolayer and as, as they were completing the monolayer, the magnetization of the cobalt was going from uh, in plane to out of plane. So they were able to tune the magnetization. And they also did the experiment with different thicknesses of the cobalt. And they saw that when the cobalt was above a few monolayers, they were losing the effect. So it's really at the interface. Uh, I mean, it may depend on from atom to atom, but in general for 3D transition metals, I would say like three, four monolayers maximum is the effect happening which is enough for transport because at the end your electrons, if your electrons need to cross those monolayers, that's it. They're gonna get whatever spin polarization happens. But when you're talking about changing the properties of a device, of a, of a magnetic layer, it has to be a very thin layer. Otherwise the effects broadens and, and disappears. One more question, uh, Fernando Bartolomé. Thanks Luis for this very nice talk. You have shown the hybridization plays a very important role in the electronic and magnetic properties of the molecules in surfaces. What about magnetic interactions among the molecules through the interface, uh, air, quark, uh, R, uh, K, K, Y, or whatever? Has it been clearly uh, detected? Okay, so if we, if we are talking about from molecule to molecule, uh, there, there have been some, some examples in which they, they look for this kind of interactions, but you know, the problem is that AKKY typically you measure transport through the molecules and, and you need a quite good quality in the measurements for, for detecting it with the thickness. So not that much. Uh, between layers, if you have different layers and you can change the interaction between the layers massively, yes, that has been seen uh, between two magnetic, let's say two, magnetic metallic layers, you can change and tune the interaction between them by, by LKKY. But again, the effects are, are really tiny. So you really need to look for them in, in dedicated experiments. And it's not very easy to, to see them with the precision that you can have, for instance, in metallic multilayers, where you can control the thicknesses with, with super nice precision in MBE or in sputtering. So the, fact, the experiments are a bit more complicated and I must say, not that nice. 
let me uh, ask you a couple of uh, more questions. Um, working with molecules, I can think that uh, one of the main disadvantages can be a degradation. Am I right or, or it's not really a problem compared to non-organic uh, devices? Well, uh, again, uh, the, the answer, it depends because molecules is such a big thing that there are many factors. In general, you have to be very careful with the storage. So, uh, for instance, many molecules get doped by air, you know, oxygen, nitrogen in air, doped, and then you, the properties change if you leave them in air. But storing in vacuum typically sorts out this problem. Uh, some molecules are photodegraded, so you have to store them in the dark. So, uh, yeah. I would say it's not a massive problem if you take some basic precautions, but in general, uh, you have to be aware that that's a problem. I mean, there is a, a whole a market of, of materials that passivate organics because of, of the, again, the, the commercial applications to avoid degradation. But uh, for us, just keeping them in the dark and in vacuum usually works. Okay, and just one last question. Would you say that uh, adding a, the optical degree of freedom is uh, the main advantage of uh, molecular spintronics uh, compared to inorganic? No. No? I mean, <laughs> I mean, this is bad because I published a few papers on that, that in very nice journals and, you know, I talk about them. I think it's cool. Uh, but we haven't been able to fully realize it yet. To me, right now, the most attractive part is the properties of the interface. I think they are, it, it, it really shocks me the kind of things we can do uh, from my basic understanding of magnetism, right? I mean, changing coercivities, changing polarization, changing these kind of things in, in a massive way that we, in organics is, is I would say impossible. So to me, that's that's more attractive. But of course, it depends on your taste, right? <laughs> thank you. No, I was asking for uh, your your own opinion. So <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so again, uh, thank you, Luis, for a very nice talk, and thank Thanks you a lot. to all the speakers in, the, in this session. We have uh, arrived to the conclusion of this uh, session. I thank all the audience for attending today's lectures. And uh, I don't know, if, uh, Fernando, if uh, you want to say something else um, at the end, or we just finish and close. We just can close the session. Thank you very much, Marian Fuchs. Thanks. Thank you very much for the invitation. And thanks for the great organization. Thank you, Luis. OK, thank you. Bye-bye.